Good afternoon and welcome to today's program titled Caring for Our Veterans. I'm Tom Valentino, Senior Editor for the Institute for the Advancement of Behavioral Health Care. Today's program is sponsored by Foundations Recovery Network and Retreat Premier Addiction Treatment Centers. Thank you to our sponsors and to our audience for giving us your time and attention today. Before we get started, we have a few details we'd like to go over. To submit a question for our presenter, please use the Q&A area below the slides at any time. You do not have to wait until the end of the program to ask your question. If you're having technical issues, please click the Test Your Connection button below the video window to chat with support. And finally, to download a copy of the presentation, please click the link in the Resources tab to the right of your slides. Special note about CE credit. To get your CE, you must watch the program all the way through the Q&A section at the end of the presentation. At the end, do not leave the web page. The site will automatically redirect you to a survey. This must be completed in order to generate your CE certificate. For those watching in a group, please download the group submission guide in the resources tab and follow the instructions provided. Please note CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It is only available for the live event on May 29, 2018. Finally, for those of you who tweet, please tweet along with us using our hashtag today, IABHC Live Webinar. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Joseph Troncali, Medical Director at Retreat. For the past 20 years, Dr. Troncali has been affiliated with Lancaster General Hospital in a number of roles with family medicine, addiction medicine, and occupational medicine. He was previously the medical director of the Susquehanna Addiction Unit and the Karen Foundation before coming to retreat. A published author, Dr. Trincali has contributed content to both Saunders' Manual of Medical Practice and When to Call the Surgeon, as well as numerous articles in addiction journals. In 2010, Dr. Trincali was named Outstanding Clinician by Addiction Magazine. Thank you, Dr. Trincali, for taking the time to speak with us today. And with that, the audience is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome to everyone. And uh, I'm, I hope everyone had a good Memorial Day weekend. So today we're going to talk about caring for veterans with uh, addiction and co-occurring disorders. Just to uh, bring you up to speed, uh, one of the things that we have been trying to do here at Retreat is to partner with the VA under what's called the Veterans Choice Program so that uh, veterans can get uh, help uh, outside uh, the VA system if it's not available within the VA system. And so uh, that prompted our uh, relationship with the VA just so that you understand kind of where we're coming from here. Uh, I have no conflicts to disclose. Uh, that's me uh, about 15 years and 15 pounds lighter uh, when I had my last day on active duty. So uh, as a veteran, uh, I have a special place in my heart for all the other people who have served and uh, continue to serve. Um, as uh, was introduced, uh, my background is in addiction medicine over about the past 20 years. Um, my uh, specific duties in the military had to do with being activated from the reserves to uh, active duty for Operation Iraqi Freedom. So I'm here uh, to share my experience from several different perspectives, first as a veteran, and then second as a physician, and third as uh, an administrator that has to uh, work through complex systems. To understand the scope of the problem, uh, there's data, these are older data, but uh, I'm going to try to update some of the uh, the sources uh, and we'll, as we go through the slides. But as of 2004 to 2006, 7% uh, of veterans developed a substance use disorder. About half of combat veterans binge drink. One in eight soldiers used illicit substances in 2008. And other risk factors and other associations for addiction include PTSD, insomnia, and traumatic brain injuries. 
So I'm sure everyone has seen some semblance of this slide. Uh, we're right in the middle of a opiate epidemic, however you want to call it, whatever you Billion and the veterans population's opiate use disorder uh, is uh, increasing, and uh, not only uh, is it increasing, but uh, it seems to be increasing at an ever-increasing rate. This is a poor slide, but if you look at substance abuse disor uh, disorder diagnoses in VA hospitals, uh, you'll have to trust me on this one because, again, the quality of the slide is not good, but the numbers continue to uh, rise. If you study uh, risk factors for suicide in veterans, what you will see is, is that uh, the number one uh, criteria is being male. Second is having a co-occurring disorder, specifically manic depressive diagnosis. Third, uh, some diagnosis of depression. Fourth is binge drinking. And fifth is alcohol use disorder or alcoholism. The other interesting thing is, is that these disorders with regard to suicide uh, are not related to combat experience or time deployed. The uh, Army suicide rate reached an all-time high in 2012, and from 2005 to 2009, more than 1,100 service members took their own lives. That's one suicide every day and a half, according to uh, some statistics, with other statistics uh, showing up to 20 a day, depending on who's doing the sampling. And also, the suicide rate for female veterans is six times greater uh, than for civilian veterans. So to go back, uh, I'm sure that I might be bringing Coles to Newcastle for some of you, but I do want to go over uh, what constitutes addiction or what is now termed substance use disorder. Uh, there's a lot of definitions, but the one that... Uh, one needs to know is uh, from DSM-5, uh, which doesn't use the word addiction at all, uh, there's categories of substance use, substance abuse uh, disorder or substance use disorder. According to DSM-5, you have to meet uh, X number of criteria to determine if you have substance use disorder. In, uh, and it's considered mild if you have two or three of these categories, uh, moderate if you have four or five of these criteria, or severe if you have six or more of the criteria. And so I'm just going to go down the list. Again, I know you can read, and I apologize if I'm uh, insulting anyone's intelligence, but uh, some of this is being taped, and uh, not everyone's going to be looking at slides. So taking substance, the substance that's uh, being abused in larger amounts for longer periods than intended. The second is wanting to cut down but being unable to cut down. The third is spending excessive time obtaining the substance. The fourth is craving. The fifth is repeated interference with work, school, or family because of the substance. The next is stopping or reducing uh, important social, occupational, or uh, recreational activities because of their use. The next is use despite harm or danger to self or others. The next is use despite recognition of problems associated with use. The next is tolerance and or withdrawal unless substances are being used appropriately under medical supervision. So again, if you have two or three of those, that's mild substance use disorder, uh, four or five, moderate and above, six or above is uh, severe substance use disorder. Another problem that we run into with veterans uh, has to do with homelessness. And statistics are better in 2017 than they were uh, earlier uh, in this decade, but there's still a ways to go. 
and uh, you can see that 11% of the adult uh, homeless population are veterans, and that uh, the vast majority of homeless veterans are males. Risk factors associated with homelessness in veterans have to do both with mental illness and addiction, as you would probably uh, expect. Also, combat exposure is associated with alcohol use disorders and uh, mental illness. In fact, this morning I took care of a patient who is uh, a veteran who had basically been in combat and had developed not only uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, but also had become addicted to multiple substances and uh, would easily uh, be diagnosed uh, as depressed. So uh, these are real patients and real situations. Traumatic brain injury statistics for veterans uh, are also fairly impressive. Mild uh, traumatic brain injury is associated with 2.6 times a greater chance for substance use disorder, and moderate uh, traumatic brain injury is associated with a 5.4 times greater chance for substance use disorder. So the epigenetics of traumatic brain injury in addiction are uh, evident here. Here's another very interesting statistic, and I believe this is very important uh, when we talk to both the Veterans Administration, Veteran uh, Administration physicians, and uh, dealing with the veterans themselves. The VA and the military is the single biggest purchaser of pharmaceuticals in the United States. Uh, it sp spent $3 billion in 2002 and $6.8 billion in 2011. Now, among those uh, pharmaceuticals include uh, a lot of opiates and other potentially addictive substances. There has been criticism in uh, popular literature and in journals regarding overprescription of drugs to active duty service members and veterans. Suicide is linked to prescription drug use <clears throat> by some studies, and prescribing opiates has only been recently curtailed to some extent in veterans' hospitals now that the opiate crisis has been recognized, and there have been programs that have been set up to try to begin to wean veterans off of opiates if they do not feel that they're absolutely necessary. The other problem is there's, there's lots of benzodiazepines and sleep medications that are prescribed that may have addi addiction potential. And again, I, am not, I do not want to come across here as blaming uh, VA physicians or the VA itself for uh, creating new problems. It's just important for all of us, whether we're in the VA system or not, to be appreciative of what's actually happening with regard to attempts to help veterans in difficult situations with both sleep, PTSD, pain, et cetera, and the reality of the potential for addiction in a, pop, in a certain percent of the population. Although there are attempts to curtail the use of substances in the VA, as I just stated, there's still a lot of potentially addictive substances being prescribed. This is not as big a problem for veterans who have no genetic or environmental predisposition to addiction, but they're inadequate screening tools to determine who is at risk and who is not. And we also see patients sometimes that come to us from the VA system who are still being uh, prescribed uh, benzodiazepines or opiates despite a history of addiction. Again, the idea being that their pain or uh, insomnia or their PTSD overrides uh, the considerations regarding their addiction. These are all things that have to be taken 
into consideration individually. Abuse of prescribed painkillers was double the civilian population between 2005 and 2008 for all veterans and four times uh, the rate of the civilian population for female veterans. Now, I could take a really long time, uh, which we don't have today, to discuss uh, pain and addiction, but I want to give you a quick summary of my own experience and what I understand in the literature with regard to pain and addiction. Obviously, pain should be treated, but there's many nuances to doing this correctly, especially in veterans with addiction. There are individuals who will never be adequately treated for pain without opiates. So I'm not opiophobic and I'm not telling people to completely stop using opiates despite addiction, etc. I want to talk about that a little further uh, here in the talk. But what I do want to want everyone to understand is, is that opiates cause tolerance and uh, the literature shows that it's probably not a good idea to use chronic opiate therapy for chronic pain. There are other modalities that should be used, and there are also limits to the amounts of opiates that are actually effective. Disability requires ongoing symptoms for some individuals, and so for some people, uh, staying on opiates or getting secondary gain for whatever reasons uh, allows them to stay in the system, and this also is a problem. I'm showing you this slide just to show what we're up against, not just in the VA population, but in uh, the population in general. This was a drug bust in Mexico, and I believe all of those bills in those stacks represent $20 bills. And that was one room out of, I think, six rooms where $20 bills were stacked uh, like that. So we still are dealing with a tremendous supply of heroin, fentanyl. There are lots of drugs that are coming into the system uh, that have nothing to do with uh, prescription opiates and if you look at the statistics, about 52% of the opiates that are used are pharmaceutical-grade opiates, and about 48% are is heroin and uh, other synthetic opiates that are procured uh, illegally or through the mail. So to back up just a little, uh, what are we talking about with regard to addiction? What are co-occurring disorders? And I would like to go over some of the facts, some of the myths, talk about the neurobiology, talk about treatment, and uh, what this means for veterans and people coming, uh, uh, people who are caring for them, sorry. So again, many of you are already very familiar with this, but for those of you who are not, I would like to give you a quick tour of the limbic cortex and talk about what addiction is, how it affects uh, everyone, but in particular veterans. If you're looking at this slide and seeing the brain, what I want you to appreciate is, is that the limbic system is that part of the brain there that is in purple and uh, mostly. And what it has to do with is, is that there's a prefrontal area that has everything to do with personality, has to do with uh, the integration of facts, uh, risk-taking, all these sorts of things. That's sort of at the beginning uh, of the limbic system with the prefrontal area interacting with the anterior cingulate gyrus. And they've done a lot of new research uh, on the anterior cingulate gyrus, and they've shown that uh, with PET scanning and that sort of thing that the anterior cingulate gyrus is closely associated with things that we label as bipolar disorder, autism, those sorts of things where mood and the ability to uh, take facts and discern between and discriminate uh, uh, takes place. 
If you continue to go down the limbic system, uh, the ventral tegmental, I'm sorry, the anterior cingulate gyrus uh, connects to the uh, nucleus accumbens at some level. The nucleus accumbens is the pleasure center of the brain, and we believe is the part of the brain that's dysregulated in addiction. Behind the anterior, I'm sorry, behind the uh, um, the nucleus accumbens is the ventral tegmental nucleus, which is the repository for dopamine. And when someone uses substances that are uh, addictive, dopamine is released into the uh, nucleus accumbens, and that's when the pleasure and the high is generated. Behind the ventral tegmental nucleus is the hippocampus, which has to do with memory. And behind that is the amygdala, which has to do with sex, rage, and trauma. Now, the reason I'm showing you all this is, is that, especially in veterans, the, uh, the limbic system can be highly deranged, just like I was talking about that one veteran I was taking care of earlier today. When people are involved in combat, when they see great trauma, when they have to take care of people uh, who are uh, injured, uh, dying, or in the process of dying, there are a lot of limbic structures that are brought into play all at one time. Now, if someone has developed mood disorder, suffered trauma, then the whole limbic system is now dysregulated and it's not just the addictive part or parts of the limbic system that we're worried about. We have to worry about many things happening all at the same time in the limbic system. Now, unless the limbic system, to get to the slide that's in front of you, unless the limbic system we just talked about is somehow sated, in other words, the dopamine levels are correctly regulated, other sorts of uh, neurochemicals are now flowing properly, satisfying the limbic system can only occur either with continued use of substances, which might include medication-assisted treatment, long-term abstinence to re-regulate dopamine, or other unexplainable phenomenon that work but we don't fully understand. And what I mean by that is, is that some people either get sober or find their way through their addiction in ways that uh, we can't completely explain. Uh, the bottom line is, is that the limbic system is in many ways like a tiger on a leash. Some individuals are able to keep their limbic system calm and are able to regulate it either with treatment, medication, or whatever. Some are not, and uh, some are destroyed by the disease. So what we know is, is that there's a dysregulation of dopamine in the midbrain of people with addiction. We know that it's multifactorial. We know that it's easier to recognize uh, with substances of abuse than with some other compulsive behaviors because the consequences are more immediate with regard to addictive behavior, less so with some behavioral issues. We know that it's not a matter of willpower. And we know that addiction is ultimately treated with changes in behavior, environment, and brain chemistry. We know that psychoeducation is important, but it's also insufficient to overcome the compulsive behavior. So there are a number of things that we know that work some of the time for some people. 12-step recovery, AA, spiritual programs, self-help sorts of uh, programs have been shown to work for uh, a number of individuals. There's a lot of controversy I know about AA and some people are down on AA, etc. And I'm not here to tell you that it works for everybody because I know that it doesn't. But I do know that it works for some people. And the reason that I believe that it works is uh, go, if we could go back to uh, and I don't want to 
click back to the slide, but if you think about the limbic system, the limbic system basically is the fight, flight, feeding, and reproduction part of the brain. If you study the 12 steps, everything about 12-step recovery is basically anti-limbic. And what the way 12-step 12 12-step 12 recovery does work for some people is is if that if they are working the steps, then for them that's their way of keeping the limbic system in check and somewhat subdued. Again, it doesn't work for everyone, but it does work for many people. Peer group involvement is very important. One of the things that we found with veterans is, is that they actually heal better when they're talking with, uh, especially with it when it comes to PTSD and things like that. If they're in a peer group of other veterans who have gone through uh, and shared experiences uh, similar to theirs, uh, they feel inclusion, there's a connectedness, and things seem to go better for them than uh, if they are not integrated into uh, a veterans group. Again, we could take another two hours and talk about medication-assisted treatment. Uh, one of the things that I want to be very clear about is, is that medication-assisted treatment, whether we're talking about uh, opiate uh, use uh, uh, or, in other words, opiate-assisted treatment, OAT, or whether we're talking about things like anti-craving drugs, which is a form of medication-assisted treatment, or an abuse for people who are alcoholic. All of those things are some type of medication-assisted treatment. What you hear about in the literature and how some people define it is mostly either methadone or suboxone uh, for opiate-dependent individuals. Um, all I want to say about that is, is that I am for whatever works. And for people who are deeply involved with their opiate addiction and who have not been able to maintain uh, any type of either sobriety or time away from drugs, uh, I am all in favor of the use of medication-assisted treatment, whether with methadone or with uh, Suboxone, uh, if they are also in a program that monitors them and allows them to use the medication properly. Uh, Medication-assisted treatment is being used <clears throat> in the VA system uh, at certain locations, and uh, we are certainly uh, supporting that uh, from our vantage point here at Retreat. Uh, another thing that works is placing people in alcohol and drug-free environments. Uh, the VA f is fortunate enough, or veterans who are able to come to treatment, uh, some of them are fortunate enough to get into long-term drug-free programs. And for those veterans, uh, if we can get them somewhere between 60 and 90 days uh, out of their normal environments, this uh, has shown to be a big help to buy them time uh, to begin to at least figure out whether or not they are able to be abstinent or whether they need medication-assisted treatment, et cetera. Certain types of behavioral therapy are certainly helpful. One of the things that we do here at Retreat is use uh, both DBT and acceptance commitment therapy, and I believe we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, trauma therapy, uh, exposure therapy has been shown to be effective for veterans who have PTSD, and uh, this is something that uh, requires training on the part of therapists, and it requires buy-in on the part of the veterans. Again, going back to some of the veterans that I've treated uh, here, one of the things that they sometimes are opposed to is the idea of being exposed to the feelings. Obviously, that is not something we we don't normally want to experience or re-experience feelings that are uncomfortable to us. But uh, if one studies the literature on PTSD and anxiety, uh, exposure therapy has definitely been shown to be helpful. And uh, for some people, it may be the only solution. The other thing that uh, helps 
people occasionally is personal decisions and crises. Uh, if you talk with enough people, what you'll find out is is that uh, getting caught up in the legal system might have se seemed to be a very bad thing on the front end, but once they were forced to get treatment in some fashion, uh, sometimes it takes. I was seeing a patient this morning who was not a veteran who basically had to go to treatment or else go to jail, uh, got clean and sober, and was maintaining sobriety uh, into their uh, second or third month. And it was uh, actually a great revelation for this particular patient that uh, this person was able to actually do that. Um, and the person said to me that they were uh, very grateful that they went to jail. And uh, again, that's not the way you want to do it, but sometimes that works for people. So again, I won't take too much time. Uh, we have about 20 minutes, but uh, everyone, I believe, probably knows something about AA and NA. Uh, the major proponent or the, I'm sorry, the major uh, thing that seems to help people, as I stated with AA, is the fact that it keeps people connected and it also keeps people uh, out of their emotional systems if they work the program. As I stated, peer group involvement is important. Uh, the veterans, especially combat veterans, tend to do better around other veterans. Uh, there's a, uh, a sense of cohesion and belonging. With the medication-assisted treatment, uh, currently we use um, mostly buprenorphine in the form of uh, Subutex or Suboxone for uh, opiate-dependent patients. Uh, there are um, methadone programs within the VA uh, that are also available. One of the things that I did not talk about uh, was the use of uh, naltrexone, both for alcohol and for opiates. Uh, using naltrexone has been shown uh, statistically to decrease the rate of relapse. Again, it works for some people and not for others. I was just at another treatment facility uh, in Maryland the other day where they used disulfiram for their alcohol-dependent uh, uh, folks, and they use it in a way where it's mandatory uh, and uh, someone is doing a pill count with their alcohol-dependent uh, patients, and for them it works because, again, they have a structured program around it. Some people are anti-abuse anti because of some of the side effects and potential danger, but, um, again, if it's properly administered, I do not have a problem with it. Again, the whole thing of harm reduction versus sobriety is a huge issue for a lot of communities. Many people don't understand the concept of harm reduction, but it's very important for people to understand that they, if, if you are an untreated heroin uh, addicted individual or using heroin regularly, your morbidity and mortality is 64 times greater than the general population. And so allowing someone to continue to use heroin untreated uh, is almost uh, like a death sentence. And so regardless of the type of treatment, uh, we believe that harm reduction has a, a definite place and statistics and the literature shows that it's something that probably should be done more rather than less. Uh, the recovering community, there's still problems within the recovering community accepting people on either methadone or uh, buprenorphine, uh, but I think that some of these barriers are being broken down. And certainly with the high-grade heroin and uh, fentanyl, norfentanyl, and all these things that are coming into the country right now, killing people, someone has to take uh, a serious look at this. 
placing people in individual or individuals in drug-free environments. Uh, these these can also be very tricky and complicated because a lot of times we will take people into inpatient and there will be no place for them to go as outpatients, either based on their insurance, based on the fact uh, that they're on MAT, uh, based on uh, what the system will allow them uh, to do, what their families will allow, et cetera, whether they're going to go back into uh, some sort of an environment that's in the legal system. So these are all important uh, things. Behavioral therapy, as I state, stated, uh, here we use acceptance commitment therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, and we also have a chronic pain group and a treatment track uh, where people who have chronic pain are able to uh, uh, be treated specifically. Acceptance commitment therapy and chronic pain are a good combination with regard to therapy from opiates because sometimes people are able to, through acceptance commitment therapy, find ways of getting into a values-driven life without opiates despite their pain. And again, that's another one or two hour lecture and I won't go into that. If anybody studied Brene Brown, uh, what you know is is that people who have been trauma uh, who have been traumatized uh, tend to develop what are called uh, shame shields because trauma, especially in younger people, tends to lead directly to shame and guilt as an unconscious process, not something that they uh, expect to have happen. But the shame shields, according to Brene Brown, are isolation, anger, and acquiescence or codependency. And so lots of the patients that we see here in the VA who have suffered trauma are either isolating, having problems with anger issues, or they go along to get along and never receive help for their uh, trauma. The trauma cycle has to do with self-invalidation and psychological manifestations of that self-invalidation. People then escape their feelings, and again, back to Brene Brown, their three escape mechanisms are numbness uh, or numbing themselves with uh, alcohol, drugs, sex, gambling, uh, eating, not eating, cutting, etc. cetera, uh, basically uh, being perfectionistic, catastrophic, and then they suffer, and then they repeat the pattern, and that becomes uh, the trauma cycle for them. Our job is to try to move people into a place of uh, self-acceptance, a safe environment, allow people to tell their stories, to do exposure therapy. If we can get people on non-addictive medications that helps their trauma, uh, there's many that are have been tried. Uh, there's uh, literature on uh, alpha blockers uh, beta blockers are not seeming to be that helpful. Uh, some of the newer medications that uh, seem to uh, help people reduce their uh, anxiety. And then lastly, to reintegrate into uh, society. As I stated, there are personal decisions that people make, crises that people get themselves into. And uh, for some people, that seems to be the... Um, the cue for them to get help. So as I stated before, uh, what we do here is we obviously detoxify people, we evaluate people both physical and psychologically, try to engage them in treatment, medicate co-occurring disorders as needed, and as I stated, we have a veterans group that, uh, that meets together. The current positives for treatment, treating veterans, it's great to have veterans in treatment. As I stated, I'm a veteran myself, and uh, I really want to support this population of people. There's a cohesive veterans group here in Pennsylvania uh, that uh, seem to uh, be very supportive of, of veterans in need. And uh, cooperation with the VA system uh, has, in general, been a very positive thing. Well, I want to go over really quickly some of the things, some of the issues that have gone on with working with the VA. 
uh, the state of the VA report from last year said that these are the issues that the VA needs to improve on, which is accountability, staffing, access, paying providers on time. Those are for providers that are going outside the system or uh, patients that are going outside the system. Uh, community care needs to be improved. The quality of the services needs to be improved. Veteran suicide uh, needs to be worked on. And then there are other areas that are really not within the scope of this uh, presentation. One of the things that we found out is, is that cooperation with the VA system is not that hard as long as you know who to talk to and those sorts of things. So we have gone uh, to the VA system and tried to find the, the people within each particular VA that uh, we can work with, and that's been uh, generally very helpful. Uh, obviously, uh, treating people for the right things in the right way is very important, respecting the veterans, having accountability at every level, being careful, listening, uh, and then a lot of the patients that we get, especially from certain VAs, uh, have the problem of homelessness and mental health issues. And working with the VA and with the uh, veteran service organizations and with the veteran social workers has been very helpful in at least trying to get people into a stable environment after uh, treatment. This goes along with relapse prevention. And as I stated, we have to cooperate with the community and the veteran service organizations. Here at Retreat, we started out small. The Lebanon VA uh, lacked the resources to do detoxification for their veteran population, and so we took on the veterans just for detox. And uh, so they were able to come to us and get detox, but what we found out was that sometimes the veterans would get detoxed here, but then when they go back to the VA system, there was not a, a, a great continuity for them to continue uh, in uh, some sort of a sober program. Uh, there's a limited number of beds for certain long-term treatment, et cetera. And so we, again, began working with them to see if we could keep the patients longer, et cetera, just to get them to a safe place. Um, and uh, we're about 18 months into treating veterans at this point, and so far we've treated about 200 veterans this past year. Um, we uh, recognize that there are changes that need to be made. Uh, we also recognize that there were needs that uh, didn't have solutions in place, and so we began uh, finding clothing for some of the veterans that didn't have clothes, and uh, that there are also organizations out there that really want to help, and we uh, began contacting them to try to see. Um, the, what we found out was is that uh, veterans, the veteran system consists of hospitals that look alike, but they don't all act alike. Uh, each veterans hospital has its own players, uh, their own their own uh, treatment things that they emphasize more than others. Uh, as again, as I stated, we have lots of stories, uh, as you can see, and uh, or as you could imagine, and so we're continuing to uh, to work with uh, veterans at many different levels and the Veterans Administration at many different levels to see if we can't uh, get better uh, treatment for them. Um, the, uh, we went to a, a meeting a couple of weeks ago with the VA and uh, there is more money and greater interest now in uh, trying to uh, get veterans into, uh, as I stated, like things like the Veterans Choice Program. And a lot of this has to do with teaching veterans how to access uh, programs, but it also has to do with uh, treatment providers who are willing to, uh, to go to the VA uh, and explore with them uh, the possibility of providing care uh, for veterans. So if I were king, uh, I would uh, take addicted veterans uh, and give them continuous, not episodic care with a lot of highly trained individuals. Addicted veterans need to be uh, connected uh, to treatment with access to care. Pain and addiction is very tricky and it needs highly specialized services. It also needs uh, the ability to work with the uh, VA 
doctors so that we're not working at odds with each other, uh, making sure that people are treated uh, well, but at the same time, we want to be as judicious as we can with addictive substances. In general, what I find is that we need to use less medicines rather than more medicines. Uh, if we could take the money that we had been spending on medications and spend it on therapy and transportation and access to care, education, those sorts of things. And then while there are specialized national centers of excellence, uh, a lot of the veterans programs that are, for instance, pain and addictions beds are very limited. And so while there are good centers that uh, exist out there, like there's a pain and addiction center, I believe, in Tampa, Florida, but the problem is that I think it has about a dozen beds. And you can imagine how many veterans probably need those services. So uh, that's another thing that we have to try to work on. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, probably uh, stop here and begin to try to take questions and answers. I would uh, like to say uh, just a couple of things before we go to the Q&A. I know I have just a couple of minutes. One of the things that I'd like to say is, is that uh, the veterans that uh, we have taken care of uh, have been uh, some really outstanding individuals and are very, uh, we, we really enjoy taking care of them. We're sorry for their suffering. The other thing is, is that uh, it's very important, as I stated, for us to try to make bridges with the VA system so that uh, the veterans don't get caught up in something that is bigger uh, than them and something that uh, they can't uh, negotiate uh, on their own. So I really want to uh, ask everyone out there who's listening to uh, to just think about this. I'm not telling you what to do, obviously, but I, I really think that there are a lot of people that we could help uh, that uh, would appreciate uh, what we're doing. So I say thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Troncali. It was a very informative presentation. Before we get into the Q&A portion of our event today, I would like to hand things over to Christy Crisman from Foundations for a few words from our sponsors. Thank you. The Heroes in Recovery 6K Virtual Race Series, powered by Foundations Recovery Network, encourages participants to run to celebrate their own recovery, walk to remember a loved one they lost to addiction, or just be part of the movement. One of the many benefits of a virtual race is that you can run or walk anytime, anywhere. Virtual races eliminate everything that may keep you from running a race in person, from early morning alarms to inclement race day weather and long registration lines. Create a team to support one of our many charity beneficiaries and invite your friends and family to join you. No matter where your finish line is, your virtual participation at home makes a tangible di difference all over the country. To learn more and to register, visit Heroes6K.com. Thanks, and back to you, Tom. All right, thanks a lot. I'd like to uh, remind everyone, uh, as we've already had a lot of questions coming in, um, you can still submit a question uh, using the Q&A area below the slides, uh, and you can do that at any time. Also, to download a copy of the slides, please click the Resources tab to the right of the presentation window. All right, let's get into some questions. Um, Dr. Trincali, can you expound upon the role of relapse prevention for substance use and co-occurring PTSD? Can you repeat the question? I just want to make sure I understood what the... Yep, sorry about that. I just uh, I deleted it there. Let's, uh, let's go back to it. Uh, can you expound upon the role of relapse prevention for substance use and co-occurring PTSD? Uh, sure. Well, I think that relapse prevention starts with uh, the continuity piece that I had talked about earlier. I don't have any magic uh, formulas, but I think it's really important for uh, people uh, regarding relapse prevention to begin by uh, validating, being validated themselves, and uh, for them to be able to have some self-compassion. The other piece to relapse prevention is obviously having the resources for the person who is in need of relapse prevention services to have some place to go. 
And again, that might sound like a, a teleologic or silly sort of a thing to say, but we do have people who get into the system and then there really is not continuity or a place for them to go to uh, continue with their uh, treatment. Uh, and lastly, uh, is that whole thing of the ability to try to teach people how to accept feelings rather than to escape feelings. And that's probably the trickiest part of all, but it's probably the most necessary part of all. Uh, one of the things that we try to do, whether it's with uh, exposure therapy or with acceptance commitment therapy, is to try to engage people into uh, using uh, mindfulness, all these sorts of things uh, where they can begin to feel rather than to escape. All right. Um, are there other modalities for treating chronic pain as an alternative to the use of opioids? Um, any Anything on that front that you can review and discuss a little bit? Sure. Well, I think the number one takeaway is is that everything is better than opioids in general for chronic pain. Uh, chronic pain is not something that actually should be treated with opioids, although it is uh, frequently. Now, if someone has been getting treated with chronic opioids, what we would begin to do is probably try to switch them over, if it's possible, to something like uh, Suboxone or something that is less hazardous uh, regarding their their health or overdose and that sort of thing. So that would be number one. Number two would be to employ as many modalities as is available uh, to try to listen and find out what it is where the person's pain is coming from. And last but not least, uh, there is a difference between pain and suffering. And we have many people who are being treated with opiates for suffering uh, and not for pain. Uh, the, their addiction uh, takes them into a place of suffering, and the opiates obviously are not going to help uh, their mental state. Uh, so uh, again, w without spending another hour talking about this, one of the things that we do is try to differentiate between pain and suffering find modalities that will work for the patient, and then help them try to learn how to live a values-driven life so that they can get on with their lives even if they do have pain. All right, next question that came in. Transportation appears to be a growing issue for veterans trying to access treatment. Uh, is there anything being done about this, um, perhaps uh, telehealth or uh, other uh, alternatives? Well, it's my understanding that the Veterans uh, Administration is attempting to use uh, uh, telehealth or whatever, uh, you know, uh, that sort of thing in, in certain centers. Uh, the transportation piece, I know that some of our veterans are being given uh, like vouchers and things like that. And <clears throat> for instance, where, where I work, uh, we do provide a certain amount of transportation for uh, the people back and forth either to the veterans centers or uh, for uh, transportation to their next destination. So uh, I, I know that they're looking at this. I know the veterans, I, and again, I don't work for the Veterans Administration, so I can't speak for them, but uh, I know that things seem to be getting at least a little better uh, for this because they're at least recognizing this to be a problem. You had mentioned uh, during your presentation that there's a lot of misinformation out there on medication-assisted uh, therapy. What do you see as being the biggest misperceptions right now, and are, are there things that, uh, as the field is evolving and, and treatment options are, are changing and whatnot, um, what, what are the biggest misunderstandings that are out there right now, and how, as a field, uh, do we overcome this? Well, it's a complicated question, but here's my best shot at it. Uh, the first thing is is that a lot of people do not understand harm reduction, and I think there needs to be a lot more education about that. It's not like we want to get people hooked on methadone or buprenorphine or something like that just so that we can keep them uh, addicted. The idea is is that you have to buy people time and space away from the dangerous drugs like heroin and fentanyl so they don't kill themselves, number one. Number two is is that for a lot of people, uh, they can 
try their very best to work an abstinence-based program, but their cravings or their circumstances just don't allow them to stay away from uh, from uh, street opiates or from uh, p prescription opiates, and they start to misuse them again. So that's number two. Uh, number three is is that uh, there is still diversion of prescription uh, types of medication-assisted treatment. So Suboxone is still being, uh, I'm sorry, sub, yeah, Suboxone is still being uh, diverted by some patients because the programs that they're involved with either are not uh, keeping a close enough eye on them or they're just doing what people that have addictions do. And so that gives it a bad name, but that doesn't mean that it's something that shouldn't be done. Uh, again, I could spend a long time talking about this. I'd be happy to take this question to another level uh, if someone has the time or inclination and they want to just email me. All right. Regarding isolation, how do we help individuals stop this behavior long term as often veterans uh, will start isolating or ruminating again and uh, sliding back outside of uh, treatment? Well, one of the things that uh, is very important is to try to uh, find groupings that the veteran is willing to uh, attend, whether it's other veterans' uh, groups, uh, AA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, isolation, as I stated, is one of the early uh, uh, shields that people use against trauma. And so if we don't deal with the trauma, probably they're going to continue to isolate if they don't feel like they're safe. And so finding a places of safety and then addressing that whole issue with veterans uh, and other people who have been traumatized is really important. Uh, so you can you can lead people to water, but you can't make them drink. And the same thing holds true. If somebody is severely traumatized, it doesn't matter what you try to get them to do. If they don't feel safe, uh, it's unlikely that they're going to carry through. So we have to try to do uh, the exposure therapy uh, the cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, dialectical behavioral therapy, acceptance commitment therapy with these people. All right. Uh, is there any evidence of any negative or particularly positive impact of virtual exposure therapy on addiction? I think that there's a lot of good literature, and if somebody wants the literature, I will try to uh, come up with uh, some papers to send them. But uh, I believe that exposure therapy uh, is at the heart of a lot of people's, uh, sorry, exposure therapy, trauma is at the heart of a lot of people's addiction. And uh, I believe that exposure therapy has been shown to be one of the best ways to try to help people uh, not escape their feelings. So that, uh, again, like I said, if, if someone wants literature, I'm more than happy to try to dig some up for them. All right, I think that's going to be just about all the time that we have for questions for today. Uh, we do have some final instructions regarding CE credit. Do not leave this page. Please continue to stay on the platform, and the site will automatically redirect you to a survey, and the survey must be completed in order to generate your CE certificate. For those watching in a group, as a reminder, please download the group submission guide and the resources tab to the right of the slides and follow the instructions provided. Please note that CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It's only available for the live event here today on May 29th, 2018. I want to thank Dr. Joseph Troncalli once again for an excellent presentation. I would also like to thank our sponsors, Foundations Recovery Network and Retreat, for making today's program possible. Finally, thank you to you and our audience for participating today. We hope you'll join us in the future for another IABHC webinar. This concludes today's presentation. Have a great day.